You are investigating a series of murders inside a busy city and are brought into the morgue. You think that the easiest way to catch the killer is to simply ask the victims who it was that murdered them. Brought before one of the bodies placed upon a stone slab, you begin a ritual during which you pour a black liquid between the lips of the corpse and you say an incantation that completes the spell. The body on top of the stone slab seizes up and begins to writhe. Out from between its lips come rasping words as you ask your questions and learn more about the killer. However, the mortician witnessed this ritual and has never seen magic like this before because you are uniquely powerful within this world. The mortician flees out of the crypt and goes and tells everybody about what they have witnessed and now you are being hunted by the Arcanist Inquisition. Hello, my name is Ben Byrne and I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. To represent magic, you should keep four things in mind. One, magic is difficult to wield. It's not as simple as picking up a short sword and stabbing your enemy with the pointy end. Oh, come on, I dare you. Two, magic is dangerous. There's a reason we tell children not to play with matches and it's because the person holding the match is just as likely to get burned. Three, Magic is mistrusted because commoners don't understand it and therefore will blame their misfortunes upon it. Well, she turned me into a newt. A newt. I got better. And four, magic is rare, partly because it is so difficult to wield, partly because it is so mistrusted, and also because it's a theme of dark fantasy. If you like this video, give it a like, and if you want to know more about how to run Dark Fantasy D&D campaigns, subscribe, because this Dark Fantasy journey is only just beginning. Magic is difficult to wield. To unbind reality and reshape it to your whims is not a simple task. It takes years of careful study to be able to cast the most simple spell to be considered even a competent wizard. Or perhaps you were born with some ancestral ability to wield magic or have made a bargain with a dark entity, in which case your patron or ancestor likely cast a shadow over your entire life. Of course, the rules for 5th edition don't really translate into capturing this atmosphere for magic because spells can be trivial to cast. Players love to show off their magic by remolding earth or cleaning their clothes. Most spells take less than six seconds to cast and usually cost little else except for a spell slot. But dark fantasy ultimately begins in a place of magic realism. What if the world around us actually did have magic imbued into it, but only a select few were able to access that innate power. Ask your players to describe their spell casting as frequently as possible, and when you have an NPC that can cast spells, you should do the same. What this does is makes the art of casting spells more evident within the game world, and there's none of this, ah, just cast fireball sort of rhetoric going around the table. Instead, your character waves their hand in front of themselves, causing heat to shimmer on the air before they thrust their hands forward and the entire area explodes into flame. The fact that magic cannot be cast subtly also means that it cannot be hidden. Now, of course, there is a sorcerer, meta magic option called subtle spell which allows the sorcerer to cast magic subtly but that's a specific class option that should be available to that class only you shouldn't allow your players to say oh i cast this spell in a crowded area by mumbling the incantation and waving my fingers by my side because magic's more difficult to wield than that you have to create an arching circle with your palm as part of the semantic components this will help capture that vibe of magic being difficult to wield and also make the subtle spell casting sorcerer feel a bit more special. Of course, if you wanna go the extra mile, you can also introduce some mechanical changes that legitimately make magic more difficult to wield. Now, you don't wanna to put too many penalties on your players, but the Grim Hollow campaign guide featured 
here, uh, does do a good job of introducing a couple of these features. For example, there is a new condition called dazed. When a spellcaster is dazed or anybody, it means that they cannot concentrate on a spell, which means that spells are more difficult to concentrate upon. If a spellcaster is concentrating on a spell and they lose their concentration, they gain the dazed condition until the end of their next turn. So they can't just go straight back into concentrating on a new spell. The other thing that you can introduce, which changes quite a bit of the game, but it makes spell slots a much more valuable and rare currency, is restructuring how the rest mechanics work. Now, in the Grim Hollow campaign guide, it refers to three different types of rests instead of the typical two. This is a quick rest, which takes the party an hour, the length of a typical short rest, and it only allows the party to recover health points by use or hit points by using hit dice. A short rest takes eight hours and is your typical get the bedrolls out, let's all go to sleep style rest. And this functions exactly the same as how a normal short rest does in vanilla 5e. The long rest takes about three days for the party to go through. It's three days of downtime, recuperating, mending injuries and waiting for themselves to heal. And this is what a full long rest looks like. It takes three days. It has to be somewhere safe. So it can't just be in a fortified room inside a dungeon for three days. They need to be in a hotel or a, a, a tavern rather, uh, a civilized area, a village, a city, something like that, resting for three days. And after that, they get all of their spells slots back. Now, you need to do quite a bit of rebalancing to the game to make this mechanic work because you don't want to be hitting your players as hard as you might usually when they regain all of their class abilities at the end of each day with typical long rests. But it also means that if you rebalance these encounters, when that fireball does go off, it'll be much more devastating and much more of an event because the wizard has to really think about when their next three day downtime is going to occur and they're going to get that spell slot back. All our lives, we've been told not to play with matches. And as mentioned earlier, that's because as beautiful as a flame is, it will eventually burn the person holding the match if you let it burn for too long. And spellcasters have the ability to summon flame to their fingertips. They can create javelins out of ice, or they can bounce lightning between their palms. That ain't safe. However, in 5th edition, there are very few rules that make magic legitimately feel dangerous, and there's good reason for that. Spellcasting should be fun for the players. You don't want to punish them too much for just engaging in their classes built-in abilities. Yet, of course, there are some mechanical and narrative-based things you can introduce into your game to make spellcasting feel more dangerous. Now, most of these will probably be narrative-based because you don't want to penalize your spellcasters too much. But let's go over some of these mechanics first, just for the thought experiment. For example, you could introduce a mechanic where when concentration is lost on a spell, the spellcaster takes a d4 of force damage for every level of the spell that they were casting to reflect how the unbinding of the arcane art whips back and kind of gives the spellcaster whiplash, uh, a, a spell whiplash. This is pretty brutal though, considering the fact that the reason they lost concentration is probably because they already took damage. Something that you could alternatively tempt your players with is this idea that they can still continue to cast spells even if they have no spell slots to do so. What they do instead is use their hit points to create spell slots, maybe 10 or 15 hit points per level of the spell. But it tempts the players into making a sacrifice to gain and utilize their power more so. There are, of course, some suggestions included in the Grim Hollow books that uh, make magic feel more dangerous, such as the School of Sangramancy. These spells, for the level of spell they are, are pretty powerful, but they require you to sacrifice hit dice to be able to cast them. This means that the spellcaster isn't hurting themselves directly in the combat, and I like this because it feels relatively well balanced, but when it comes to taking that quick rest or that short rest, they're going to be limited in how much health they can recover then as their arcane strain catches up with them. And finally, there are transformations, which is when your, your spellcaster or any character really starts to take on some 
aberrant attributes from some horrible monster. These can be things like turning into a vampire or turning into a werewolf because you've been bitten by that type of creature. But you could introduce alternative causes of these transformations. For example, Maybe if you cast too many spells while you've got a pact with a great old one, you begin the aberration transformation where you grow tentacles and chitinous shells over your body. Magic is mistrusted. And frankly, why wouldn't it be? If I was a commoner who didn't understand magic, I would assume that a spellcaster who walked into town was capable of literally anything. The NPCs in your campaign world don't understand that most mages are limited to a select number of spells. They also probably don't understand what a spell slot is either and that mages can run out of magic after having used too much in one day. Therefore, commoners would be suspicious of mages purely through a lack of understanding but also possibly because they have witnessed some of the dangerous effects that magic can have that we've discussed, such as people losing their minds or monsters wandering into the village from the local wizard's tower. Therefore, when NPCs witness magic being demonstrated in front of them, they are likely to have any number of great reactions from extreme mistrust to possibly extreme devotion, and that might depend on the type of magic that you're going to cast. Note that the NPCs can't read your player characters' minds or intentions either. I've had a lot of campaigns where I've played with a necromancer and they want to walk around with this army of zombies and waddle into the village with their seven zombie friends, Joe and Bobby and Susie and Fran. But the villagers just see seven undead shambling husks walking into the village. Of course they're going to freak out and panic, especially because they haven't seen this sort of thing happen a lot before and there's no reason they should trust the spellcaster. Anything that you introduce to make magic feel mistrusted in your campaign world is probably going to be narrative based. There's no real reason to introduce new mechanics here, but it leads to some really fantastic role play opportunities for your mages to engage with. And villagers may consider different types of magic in different ways. If you have a divine caster walk into the village who heals someone, it's possible that everyone around will fall to their knees and start worshipping this cleric as a prophet of their god. It doesn't always have to be suspicion and mistrust, but there should always be a reaction for mages walking into a place where magic is not common. That said, mages don't have to be mistrusted everywhere within your campaign setting, and you should create safe havens that your spellcasters can retreat to. We've talked a lot about, you know, direct and indirect penalties for spellcasters because spellcasting is difficult and dangerous, but there should be places in your campaign world that make it safe to be a mage. You know, there's the, the White Tower, there's Aratusa. safe. Magic is rare within dark fantasy campaigns and largely the reason for this is because as we've discussed magic is difficult to wield and magic is dangerous but it's worth discussing how to make magic feel rare within a dark fantasy campaign in its own right. And there's a couple of things that you can do to achieve this narratively. You don't really need to introduce new mechanics per se to, to capture this theme of magic being rare. The first thing to note is that mages should not be populous within your campaign world. They should be pretty rare to come across uh, as NPCs and even as opponents. This can create a bit of an imbalance if you have a lot of spellcasters in your party because it means that your party can devastate a, a group of martial based monsters and minions fairly easily and there's no one there to counter spell them or to dispel magic or anything like that. But that's actually okay because it makes your players or their characters feel like they are more unique and special within the campaign world because no one can stop their magic. Another way to make magic feel rare within your campaign is not to have too many magic items. And the reason I get a bit tetchy around this topic is because it's not a popular thing to do with players. Players love finding magic items. They love the power boost between levels uh, in my experience, but there's a few things that you can do to make magic items rare without making the players complain too much. 
For example, introduce magic items that are expendable, such as potions or scrolls, or perhaps something that breaks over time. This means that the party can get an influx of uh, new abilities, new boosts, but once they're used, they disappear. And so it doesn't feel like they're finding these you know, highly powerful artifacts every other room when they're exploring the dungeon. But when your party do find that one magical sword of epicness, it is actually going to feel epic rather than them just throwing it on the pile with all their other magical items that they found, their seven other magic swords, their shovel of plus one, their bow of unerring accuracy, their cloak of invisibility, their boots of blindless speed, their goggles of see absolutely everything, their hair gel of flaming fingertips, their fingertips of laser pointing, their toe nails, you get the point. When they find that sword, it's gonna feel like Excalibur. It's gonna feel epic. And it gives you room to be able to create magic items that are perhaps a little bit more powerful because they do come along less commonly. Finally, you don't wanna put a magic item shop on the corner of every street. If there is someone who is selling genuine, authentic magic items that aren't just expendable potions or scrolls, you want to keep those in concentrated, populated areas such as major cities, maybe one of those safe havens we talked about earlier, like the Ravencourt Sanctuary or Aratusa. But that's not something that should happen every other session. They should come across these magic item shops every couple of sessions, maybe. But the flip side is, because these shops are so rare, the market value on magic items goes through the roof if the party actually wanna sell them. And those are my ideas about how to incorporate magic into your Dark Fantasy 5e campaign. What did you think? Are you going to incorporate all of those ideas into your game? Maybe just some of them? Even if you're not going for a Dark Fantasy vibe, they're worth considering. If you want to see more videos on how to run a grittier, darker campaign of D&D, make sure to subscribe to this channel because I have a lot more thoughts and comment down below so we can keep the conversation going because I want to keep talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Seven other magic swords, their shovel of plus one, their bow of unerring accuracy, their cloak of invisibility, their boots of blindless speed, their goggles of see absolutely everything, their hair gel of flaming fingertips, their fingertips of laser pointing, their toe...